native of Washington State. He now shares time between Washington and Alaska. George is a sales rep with Sage Rod since 1987 and also represents Rio, Reddington, and Sitka gear. Early in his guiding career, George developed the popular Alaska Boo Fly Series, which is still popular today. George is always entertaining and is an engaging casting instructor and presenter. Take it away, George. Thanks, sir. So, there's about 50 people in front of me by rough count. How many of you 50 have spay cast before? So about 50% of you. So, of the 50% who haven't, is it on your agenda? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. So, the cool thing up here for Alaskans, maybe more so than virtually anywhere other than, you know, the state of Oregon maybe can pretty well vouch for this one, or Oregon and Washington combined can vouch for it is you've got more spay opportunity than virtually any place on earth and it can go from a two-way trout spay rod on the park sideway for grayling all the way to kings you could be down at sunken island in the lower river today fishing the spay rod for kings and actually have reasonable expectations of getting something done so it abounds with opportunity. And the one thing you'll find, for those of you that have not done this, I'm from Washington, so it decided to start raining. <laughs> How natural. Um, is that you can catch more fish up here doing the typical things that go on, okay? An example of that is fishing a nine and a half foot seven weight rod the first couple days of the opener with a size two Dalai Lama, which is basically equivalent to killing a sparrow and rigging him with a hook. Okay? And you'll catch lots of fish doing that, right? Why? Because it works. I'm not going to throw that size two Dalai Lama on this spay rod because it won't go well, number one. But a size six will go well because it's castable. But fishing with these things, you will find, is just fundamentally more interesting and it's more efficient. And within the specter of more interesting and more efficient, more effective will come. Will come. But it's these rods are far, far more interesting to fish with because every cast is an adventure. <laughs> Literally. It's the fishing equivalent of shooting a bow. And I'm a big bow hunter. I think I hunted nine states last year. And um, this is the archery of fly fishing, is what these things are. And you'll fall in love with it. And for those of you who don't have a rod yet, you'll you'll start out with one and then you'll find the needle is in the arm. <laughs> Suddenly you have two or three of them, and you'll be just as sick as the rest of the people that are already doing it. And we're not working on any medicine to help you with the sickness either. In fact, there's, there's no anti-drug for spay. It just gets worse. Okay? But you'll enjoy it. So, I had a gentleman this morning chat me up. He's in the crowd, he's about 16 feet from me right now. And we were having a talk about rods for Alaska. Because you've got all this stuff, Kings on the Lower Kenai, just to, you know, just to talk about basically what amounts to a 200 mile radius. Kings on the Lower Kenai, grayling on the Park Highway. What are you gonna start with? Well, if, if, Rainbows, dollies, steelhead, which is the south central triple header that everybody can go do. You probably are going to start with a six or seven weight spay rod. A six or a seven. 
in my advice in buying a rod, regardless of who, what manufacturer you get, be it Sage, be it Loomis, Echo, Reddington, Winston, doesn't really matter, is try to think in your head, well, what am I going to go do? And if it's going to be kind of a rainbow dolly steelhead mixed bag, it could be a 7, it could be a 6. We call the 7 weights the 30-06 of spay because they'll basically do anything, even small kings, you know, like small Kisilov kings. A 7's the bottom end of that. It'll work. It's not ideal, but it'll work. But be thinking about what else. If you get a 7, then a 5 is a branch rod for smaller stuff, say real trout game and a nine weight becomes your king game so think about where that first rod where does it branch I mean I realize I'm a sales rep and there's a soft sell going on in that statement but you'll thank me later because you will end up with a couple of these things if you get into it so that first one creates what's the branch off of it up or down so that's something to think about okay all right, so today I'm going to cast with a 12 and a half foot Reddington Dooley. It's purple. We do a few of them with purple. Steel had like purple, so you should like purple. Okay? But it's a 12 and a half foot seven weight. It's a pretty ideal rainbow dolly steel head silver rod. It's perfectly at home for all of that. It's got a 500 grain line on it, a Skagit head. This one's in orange, it's an instructor line. I only brought it because it's super mega visible, which makes it easy to see and kind of get a handle on it, okay? So the first thing I want to talk about is grip, is grip with these things. They're called two-handers, which turns out you're going to use both. You're going to have what's called an upper hand, you're going to have what's called a lower hand, okay? When you grip one of these for the first time, get your head around the idea that you're going to create a fulcrum. A fulcrum. And the best way to do that is for whatever your upper hand is. <laughs> so, put your upper hand on the upper part of the rod. Put your lower hand at the very it degree bottom. Why? That creates the fulcrum for this rod. You can slide that upper hand an inch down, even about two inches, but if you come much below that with that hand, almost regardless of where the lower hand is, you've lost your fulcrum. It doesn't mean you won't cast, but it does mean you won't cast well. So spread your hands. Bottom, top, that's the best spot to be, okay? All right? So some other things going on here. When, when you go to cast, whatever shoulder you're going to cast off of, have that leg slightly in front. So if I'm going to cast off my right shoulder, have that right foot a little bit in front. The reason why... So when you come around to cast, all that weight and movement is going to shift off this side, be it the shoulder, the torso, hips, and leg. And it'll, you'll actually come, you can actually feel yourself shift that weight all the way to your foot. If that foot is forward off that shoulder, then your balance point is firm and established. Okay? Second thing. Always square up where you want to go. If you want to cast at 80 degrees, square up to 80. If, if you're at 90, which is obviously straight across, it's going to be funky to throw basically anywhere other than where you're facing because it's where your alignment's going to go. So square up where you want to go, okay? I'm a huge advocate of casting between 80 and 70 degrees with a spay rod, okay? And the reason why I'm a huge advocate of that 
is I want that fly. If you guys are all fish, Bill, you're a really big one, by the way. Um, I want that fly to come at you guys like this, like my hat. That hat's broadside, right? You guys are all fish. In the course of that fly swinging, you get to see that hat. That hat is very visible to you if it's broadside, right? If it comes at you like this, it's not as visible, right? This is a very real phenomena that I'm actually talking about, meaning if I cast it 90 degrees, which is straight across, for reference that's 80, 70, 60, 45. So once again, 45, 60, 70, 80, 90. If you throw at 90 and you don't get a sufficient mend behind that fly, that fly will end up coming at you like this as, as a potential fish. If you throw at 80 or 70, the odds of that fly coming broadside go up dramatically. Okay? And it's hard enough to play a swung fly game and have your fly only showing 25% of its profile versus 100%. So I'm a big advocate of that cast that could be 70, could be 75 or 80 degrees, and it's for that reason, okay? Now some people will say, they'll say, well, George, <coughs> by doing that, you cut down on the angulation of which you had to work with to sink that fly. And on paper, that's true. Now, if you go back, geez, guys, 20, go back about 43 years to the first really good book written on steelhead fishing by Trey Cohn. It came out in the 1970s. And if you, I don't, anybody here have that book besides me? Okay, a handful of you, okay? If you read the winter steelhead chapter, Trey Combs will actually tell you to throw a quarter angle upstream. Literally, to, so if that's 90, he's going to tell you to cast at the ladder over there. And by God, when I was a 10th grader in high school, I was winter steelhead fishing with a full sinking line, God forbid, with a polar shrimp, size 2, and I was casting a quarter angle upstream and catching steelhead reasonably fluently on a tributary of the Snoqualmie River in Washington State with a full sinking type 3 line a quarter angle upstream on a fly that basically is a piece of yarn. And you're like, well, geez, George, that's a lot different than what you're talking about today. Well, today, folks, we got all sorts of tackle that we didn't have anything of back in those days. If I was catching steel out on a type 3 full sinking line, which is a fairly ridiculous setup to think I was doing that, the reason why it worked is there were fish in there. That's the number one reason it worked. There's nothing like having a resource, right? So, but today, I'm going to take that angle of cast over that one because I've got sink tips that will sink twice as fast, three times as fast as that line I was fishing in 1976 okay we have sink tips that are a type six what's type six mean it means it sinks six inches per second or ips so when you see a sink tip and you see i p and s you're like what's that mean inches per 
second. Type six, type eight. Then you've got all these sink tips out of tungsten. You guys have heard of, you know, T-series sink tips, right? T stands for tungsten. And when you see something like T14, you're like, does that sink 14 inches a second? Well, I wish it did, but it doesn't. It's 14 grains per foot. T14 sinks at nine inches a second. T17 sinks at 10 inches a second. So if you think about that, I'm compensating from an old school upstream cast or even 90 degrees by going between 80 and 70 degrees to maximize a broadside swing because I've got sink tips that are capable of sinking at rocket speeds pursuant to what's ever been available in history. So our tackle today is really, really giving us an opportunity to do some stuff that was never really available, okay? All right? I don't know when I'm talking today later. Where's my, where's my banna? Where'd my banna go? Well, today I'm talking sometime, it's on the, on the list about the understanding sink tips and motion. <coughs> and I'll do it up there where I've got all the rods. 2.30. Yeah, and you guys want it. Thanks, Vanna. Um, <laughs> you, guys, you guys are going to want to come to that because if you've ever wanted to understand sink tips and mows, you guys are going to want to come listen to that because you'll get a pile out of it, okay? All right. So, any questions before I do a little casting? <coughs> no questions. Yes, sir. If you want to use a sink tip to get your fly down and you cast over at the ladder, wouldn't you still have the advantage of that extra grip? It would sink still over there and then still have the line as opposed to casting it out here and then yep. having it angled down over here. Did you guys all hear the question? So his question was, given that I can have these more modern sink tips and such, if I went ahead and threw a quarter upstream or straight ass into that ladder, couldn't I get even deeper? Well, the answer is, which is an obvious answer, is the answer is yes. But what, I'm, but what I want to avoid with these things, frankly, I want to avoid it with a single-hander with a sink tip. I want to avoid the fly being behind the sink tip. So, if I did cast up there, I have to manipulate things with meds in order. Look at my hand, okay? So, <coughs> my hat's the fly, right? My hand could be construed as the sink tip. My black sleeve could be construed as the head or the skagit line in the case of the spay rod. So if I cast right at that raft, that thing is going to land more or less like this or possibly with a little hook in it if there's an upstream wind. I've got to get this thing by the time it gets below 90 degrees, I've got to get it straight. If I don't get it straight, and that fly is behind the belly, which is represented by my black arm, that fly is coming at you, and let's just say you're a 28 inch rainbow. <laughs> that fly is coming at you like this. I want that fly coming at the 28 inch rainbow like that. Because if it comes at him like that, he gets to see it and really see it versus, hey, here's some more shit coming down the river. <laughs> okay? He sees it. This he sees, he not only notices, he sees that he might notice, but not really see, right? So it's difficult to get this if that fly is behind that belly at all. And it's hard to get that belly out on that impact. 
angle. It's really hard to do that. Now, that's not to say that a game fish won't take that fly. Because they will. A rainbow <laughs> trout, particularly post-spawn, which are going to be when this ditch opens up, this in the middle, those things are post-spawn, they're still a little edgy, and they're hungry. Hungry's really good. And they, those guys will come off themselves to go get stuff. But that's a lot different than a winter steelhead on the Olympic Peninsula sitting in 40 degree water that ain't moving for shit all stupid. Okay? Or a king salmon laying in five and a half feet of water in the lower Kenai that's not probably going to move too much. A big one's not. 12 pound Jack is. He's a little dumbass. He'll come get it. The big boys aren't moving that far. Okay? So, employing these big sink tips with flies that show broadside profile is really critical, particularly for stuff like the Kings, Winter Steelhead, Sea Run Browns. If you ever get to go to Terra del Fuego, I've been fortunate to go eight times. You need to be able to show that fly and you need to try to get it deep. Okay? And if you go to Scandinavia, you'll see all these guys still fishing with 14 foot nines, 15 foot tens. And you could go over there with a 12 and a half foot eight weight and throw 90% as far with about 72% less fatigue. And the Advil can stay safely in your dump, kid. But these shorter, these lines have propelled the use of shorter rods over the last, essentially, 30 years. Any, any other questions? What, what, what about switch rods? Does that still have a place? So switch rods hit around 2000. 2003 and when switch rods came out they were just that switch rods okay you could use them two-handed you could single hand them you could spay cast them with one hand you could spay cast them with two hands they got real popular up here in places like Michigan, Northern California, South Central Alaska, a little bit on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State, NorCal, blah, blah, blah. Because they were unbelievably effective out of boats as indicator rods, which is the primary thing you see with them up here. For me, they've never been an indicator rod. They've never been a single-handed rod. They've been baby spay. So all these trout spay rods that we're all now yakking about, that shit started with switch rods. Trout spay started with seven weight switch rods, sports fans. And one of my favorite spay rods for rainbows up here is a 4116 Sage 1. It's 11 foot 6, 4 weight. It's a switch rod. It's a baby spay rod. And it's an awesome little stick for rainbows and dollies. My biggest knack knack rainbow, I've landed 30, 15 rainbows over 30 inches up here over the years. My single biggest one is on that four weight. So switch rods can be thought of as single handed special use tool or baby spay. They are the original trout spay rods. Any other questions? Any answers? Thanks for coming. <laughs>